So right off the bat, I have two confessions to make for you, if that's okay. Two confessions. The first, I'm ridiculously excited to be here. That's, you can use that phrase, ridiculously excited to be here, for a couple of reasons. So number one, I've had the privilege for the past year or so with working on uh, community college completion issues, uh, and everybody always talks about Phi Theta Kappa as one of the people that are really spearheading making those numbers better, which is awesome. So to be able to speak into that is really cool. The other reason, and this is a little known secret, I didn't even tell Monica, is that <clears throat> several years ago, in this city, in this hotel, in this room, actually it wasn't this room because this room divides up, it was actually probably over here, so where you all are. So, in this room, I quit my job. <laughs> so, this doesn't make it into the bio ever, uh, but in a past life, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. I literally sold drugs out of the back of my car. <laughs> And it was, it was great, it was wonderful. My, my wife is a physician, so it was a little weird that we were on opposite sides of the, um, the equation there. And it just, it didn't have any meaning, right? It was a ton of fun, but I could not connect to that sort of meaning. And there were lots of other things that I wanted to do. And literally, in this city, in this hotel, in that room, um, sorry, um, in that room, I was sitting at a meeting, a sales conference, designed to sort of rally the troops, 2,000 sales reps for this company. It was designed to really rally the troops. And I sat there on my laptop and typed my resignation letter. I decided, I didn't send it, because I'm smart. I didn't send it, but I decided that was it. I was done, I'm gonna apply to graduate school, I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna become an educator, and I'm gonna actually make a difference. So, to those of you that are, that are in the room that are educators, et cetera, it took me a little while to get there, sorry. Um, but I'm here, and I'm here because of this room, so that's really cool. So that's confession number one. Confession number two is a, little, uh, is a little more interesting, a little more vulnerable, if I may, and it is that the best possible way to introduce you to what kind of my work, my writing, this book and this talk is all about is with a phrase that I didn't write. Um, and I, actually, I didn't even think of it until after the book came out. Uh, but it's pretty good, so I stole it. And it's this, the stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true. The stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true. Do I have any psychology professors, psychology instructors in here? So you, oh, two of you, awesome. Three, all right. So you know about self-fulfilling prophecies, confirmation bias, all of those sort of things. What they all mean, the stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true. Whatever you tell yourself about your abilities, about your knowledges, about your potential, it becomes true. We look for reasons for it to be true. We selectively filter out or filter in information that confirms what we already believe. That's why it's confirmation bias. We're not all that creative with naming stuff. So the stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true. And really that was the discovery that, that led me to start down this path of, of creativity. If you, if you listen to the bio, my background education-wise is in organizational psychology and leadership. So what in the world am I doing writing and studying for years about creativity? I had asked myself this question, what is it about the leaders of incredibly creative companies and creative organizations, what do they do differently than other people. A pause actually on differently. I love that Stephanie's talk is called Listen Differently and that you guys are talking about Think Differently because my undergraduate was in English and I hate every time I hear Apple think different. <laughs> it's grammatically incorrect. Anyway, um, so there's that. So what is it that they do differently? And one of the primary things that I found was it was about the stories that they told each other about themselves, about their work, about their abilities. See, the thing about creativity is when you really boil down and you, and you look at the people who do incredibly creative work, there's a significant portion of them, and the people who don't uh, necessarily engage themselves in creativity, almost the majority of them, talk about creativity in a very uniform way. Uh, they talk about it like it's a religion. Have you ever noticed that? They talk about it like it's a religion. So they'll, they'll say things like, oh, I didn't feel inspired, inspired from the Greek, meaning to be breathed upon. Did you know that? Right? Or they say, the idea just came to me. Well, where was it before? That's, I've actually always wondered that, because if we could figure that one out, we can all just go there, and that'll be awesome. <laughs> so where was it before, right? Or, and they'll say, and they'll say, this is my favorite, they'll say, oh, so-and-so is a creative. You know, the way that we say so-and-so is a Buddhist. Right? 
Um, and truthfully, some people who work in, in or, or fancy themselves as working in incredibly creative endeavors, the artists that a lot of us know, they, they kind of look like high priests of some esoteric religion, right? They have tattoos and piercings. Um, they use creative as a noun. They call themselves a creative, right? I call them a barista, but that's beside the point. <laughs> So we talk about creativity like it's a religion, and this is dangerous. Why this is so dangerous is that when we talk about it using this term, we set kind of a, a guiding line, right? Every religion, like it or not, every religion has sort of tenets of faith. You subscribe to these, and you're in. You don't, and you're not. And I have a problem with that for creativity because there is no dividing line. All of the research that I found, there is no dividing line. This is something that we all have access to. Some of us are better practiced than others. A lot of us fall out of practice in doing it, but it's something that we all sort of were given that ability to do. And so to say that it's, there's a certain lie and there's a certain tenet of faith, there's a certain skill, it doesn't help very much. Right? It's not a very good idea to do that. And so that then, of course, begs the question, if everybody has access to creativity, where does creativity come from? And this is one of the most interesting things that I found. I will show you in one quick picture where creativity comes from. Give me a second, I'll explain it. Okay. So there are four factors. This comes from the work of Teresa Immobile. She's a brilliant educational psychologist, now actually teaches the folks at Harvard Business School how to be creative. Uh, I wish she wouldn't have taught the accountants how to be creative, but that's beside the point. Um, and she said that there are four things that, four factors that influence when people have, the, have creative insights. I know what you're all thinking because this is Nerd Nation and you're all very smart. There are only three circles. We'll get to that. So four factors, <clears throat> expertise, creative thinking, motivation, and a mystery fourth I'll tell you in a second. So expertise deals with uh, the actual knowledge you have in the field. If you ask 10 different researchers on creativity to define creativity, you'll get 11 answers because one of them will have a footnote. If you ask them to define it, all of, those, all of those definitions will be very different, but they'll all circulate around two words, novel and useful, new and useful, practical and original. The idea is it has to be new and it has to be useful to the world. Right? In order to, for it to be useful to the world, you have to have some level of expertise. Interestingly, too much expertise might be a bad thing. We'll talk about that in a second. But you have to have some level. If you're, going, if you're an architect and you're going to design a bridge, I really hope you took physics. Right? You need some base level of knowledge. And then creative thinking skills. And you, you actually already heard it from one of your student leaders today. He stole like 15 minutes of my speech in one line. It's a skill. It's a skill that can be learned, right? It can be developed. And we'll talk about how and where it becomes developed as a skill, but it is not a, a sort of gift. And those barista, uh, those creatives <laughs> that we talked about earlier, so often they put these two circles together. And they say that creativity is an expertise. Some people have it, some people don't, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's really dangerous. Just because you know how to use Photoshop does not mean you're creative. People use Photoshop to make uncreative stuff all of the time, right? <laughs> And just because you're creative doesn't necessarily, and you can come up with lots of ideas, doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly quite yet how to make them useful. Right? Some of you have had those ideas, and then later on late nights you see it on like an, uh, an infomercial, and you think, I had that idea, yes, but we didn't figure out how to scale it yet. Right? That's the useful part. And then lastly, motivation. Uh, it's said so often that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Really, necessity is the mother of innovation, because when you have a need, you're very, very motivated to figure out the solution to that need. Intrinsic motivation tends to work better than uh, extrinsic motivation. We'll talk a little bit about that and why that is. It is possible to get intrinsic and extrinsic motivators sort of lined up. And this room in particular should know that it's possible to do that because if you've ever taken a class that you A, enjoyed and also wanted to get a good grade in, you've been intrinsically and extrinsically motivated towards the same goal. So it is possible to get them aligned. It's really tricky and a lot of organizations don't do it well. Okay, so what's the fourth? And this, I think, is the most important insight in Teresa Immobile's uh, work. The fourth is the social environment. The fourth is the blue. You'll see this blue throughout the entire presentation. The fourth is the blue. It's the social environment. Because if we're in a social environment that supports creative ideas, then we'll have them. And you all know this is true because you've all had an idea at some point, spoke up, got shot down, and decided it's better to just fall in line and be a good little soldier, right? And suddenly, your ideas are squelched. So if, you, if you're inside of an organization that supports limited risk taking, that supports hearing uh, ideas and perspectives from everyone in the room, that supports the, uh, the uh, willingness to suspend judgment for a time while an idea can be tested, you're in a social environment that supports creativity. If you're not, then we can have all of these three circles, and none of them will have any effect. We can have all of these, and you might get that first insight, but eventually that motivation piece 
goes away. And once the motivation piece goes away, you start to fall out of practice in your skills and coming up with new ideas. And truthfully, once that happens, it's not really all that much fun anymore, so sometimes your expertise can even suffer because you stop keeping up to date in your field. So the social environment is incredibly important. So important it had to be left off the slide so you would remember it. <laughs> so where did this idea of the myths of creativity come from then? Because I think what's so interesting is that if this is it and we figured out the four factors, why doesn't everybody kind of do it, right? We know this, right? And this is where this, this myth idea comes from. This is where the stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true comes from. Because what I found is there are several predictable stories that people tell themselves about how creativity and innovation and design happen that sort of explain it but aren't actually all that helpful. And that's really, if you think about it, that's what a myth is. Myths are sort of useful lies, right? They're attempts to explain some mysterious phenomenon that we witnessed at some point, but we don't know all the information, right? And once we learn more information, we look back on the people that thought that old thing and learned it's a myth, right? And I can point to all sorts of myths around, around creation, around the actual Greek muses, around also, actually, actually last week I was in Greece giving a talk and I literally saw the effect of mythology on a people, right? But it's not mythology when you're in the moment, you just think it's truth, right? But once you learn a little bit more, once you study and once you research, you learn that that's actually sort of a myth. And this is where we are in the science of creativity. We've been studying it for, well, not we, because I haven't been studying it for 50 years. Um, I've got some gray hairs, but not that many. Um, so we've been studying it as a collectively as psychologists for uh, five decades, if not longer, serious study for at least five decades. And we know a lot that, that a lot of these myths aren't true, but they still persist. And so I've taken it sort of upon myself, and now all of you, you didn't know you were going to get recruited, but that's the fun of speaking to a nation, um, <clears throat> to change these myths and to spread that sort of truth. And so, that, like I said, there are 10 very predictable stories that people tell themselves that aren't true, but are true because we tell them to ourselves. Right? The first is probably the most prevalent. It's the story of the Eureka. The Eureka, I call it the Eureka myth. You know the story of Eureka, right? Archimedes in the bathtub. Or, or my favorite is actually the story of Isaac Newton and the apple. You're familiar with this story? Oh, tell me the story. Okay, so Isaac Newton is where? So he's under a tree. What happens? The apple falls on his head, and what happens? Gravity, right? <laughs> because some people said discovers gravity. Some people realized, wait a minute, we obviously knew about gravity. We just couldn't explain it. So some, we, we got the gravity piece. We don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, if you're keeping track, he, uh, the story goes, he figured out a mathematical principle to explain how gravity affected planetary bodies. Right? That's not as much fun as saying he discovered gravity, so we changed the story. In fact, we changed a lot about the story. So I've looked, I've tried to find this story, and the closest thing I can find is, uh, it doesn't look a lot like this story. It's actually in the diary of a gentleman named William Stuckley. Have you ever heard of William Stuckley? I just said his name like three times. Where are you? <laughs> William Stuckley. William Stuckley was an apprentice of Isaac Newton, and William Stuckley uh, wrote it, kept a diary of his time studying with Newton. And in one page of the diary, and it's actually really cool, there's a museum in London that has put the entire diary online. You can virtually flip through the pages. And in one of those pages, you read a story, and the story goes like this. After dinner, Newton and I retired to the garden for tea, they're British, tea. Uh, <clears throat> and while we were there, Newton pointed to an apple that had fallen on the ground and said, I'm working on a theory I think that the same force that compels that small body to the ground is the force that can explain how the heavenly bodies stay in motion. Flip the page, new diary entry. That's it. No apples falling, no grand discovery, no nothing. Right? But that story is really boring. You all look bored just me telling you that story. Right? <laughs> that story is really boring. So what do we do? Over, hundreds, over decades and over hundreds of years, we've, we've changed the story. Right? So uh, the first thing that happens is we do away with Stuckley. That guy's a, a terrible bore. Let's just get rid of him. By the way, that's the tragedy of writing about history instead of making it. Anyway, so we do away with Stuckley. And then, of course, it, it's no good if, if Newton is sipping tea. Where does he need to be? So we move Newton over here, right, gradually. <clears throat> but of course, if the apple's on the ground, that's still kind of boring. So what do we do? We raise the apple up from the ground. We reattach it to the tree. We put Newton underneath it, gravity. Or should I say, gravity. Uh, but here's the problem with that. I was an undergraduate English major, so I studied how stories are, are made. And there's this fancy term in English. Where are my English people here? Yes. There's this fancy term, protagonist, right? 
Now, I just told you the story. Who is the protagonist? The apple. The apple's doing all the work, right? And this is, and so this is like, and I have, I have two kids. They're, they're three and they're one, and I'm going to be the worst father ever because I'm never going to tell them this story because it's a terrible story. The lesson of the story is sit under a tree and wait to get pegged in the head by a piece of fruit. That's not going to help anybody, right? So what's going on, though? There's a reason we tell that story. There's a reason we resonate with the story. There's a reason we love that story. There's a reason we, there's a reason we tell people. There's a reason whole TV shows are built off this idea of the eureka. Right? Does anybody ever, did anybody ever watch the show House? Right? House. Brilliant. Did you know he's British, by the way? If you ever listen to an interview, it'll throw you for a loop. So House, House follows the same plot line every episode, right? So patient comes in, mysterious illness, House and his team nearly kill the patient for like 44 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> then some weird piece of information happens, right? And he learns something new and he has this, usually he's like berating Cuddy or he's bouncing a tennis ball off the wall. He's doing something unrelated, gets that thing. And then, and then House, who was crippled for 44 minutes, is running across the hospital. <laughs> injects the patient with some mysterious red vial. If I could figure out what was in that vial, it would have made a much better living as a pharma rep. Uh, injects the patient with some mysterious, and the patient's fine and for some reason doesn't sue. <laughs> right? So we follow plot lines of this story. We love this story of the Eureka because we've all had that moment, right? If I asked you, where do you get your best ideas? What are you going to tell me? Shower, right? It's the only like, safe for work time we can talk about bathing. Right? Every other time, it's not cool to talk about bathing. Right? That's probably why we love the story of our communities in the bathtub. It res these stories resonate with our experiences. So that begs the question as a psychologist, what's going on? Why does that resonate with our experience? And fortunately, there's a researcher that explained that. His, his name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Has anybody ever heard of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi? <laughs> OK, I, so judging by the hands and the reactions, all of you have read his name and not known how to say it. Is that? So Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Some people say chicks sent me highly, uh, which I think it sounds way too much like chicks think of me highly. And so, <laughs> and by the way, if you ever want to just, if you ever want to impress someone, right, at a, at a party or something, just say this, this phrase. So according to me, high chicks sent me high, and then you can say whatever you want. <laughs> because they're not paying attention. Because they're like, wow, he knows how to say the name. He must be really smart. So according to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, <laughs> the research study that he actually did, he, he surveyed hundreds of outstandingly creative people in their field, and he asked them all, this I think is brilliant, he asked them all, who do you admire? Right? And then when their names sort of congregated, he sent, he sent invitations to about 150 people, half of which actually, I love this, half of them said, I'm too busy changing the world to respond to your survey, which I think is telling, right? There's a power in saying no to some stuff like that. But thankfully, some of them did. About 70, 70 plus people responded to the survey, and he asked them a very open-ended question. Explain to me your creative process. What is the process that you use? And then he sort of collected all of their answers, he coded them, and he found that almost everybody follows roughly the same five stages. Right? Everybody follows the same five stages. Preparation, incubation, insight, evaluation, and elaboration. There will not be a test, you don't have to remember them all, but preparation, insight, incubation, Evaluation and elaboration. Right? Now, I'm particularly interested in stages two and three, incubation and insight. Right? That's why there are eggs on there. It's an incubator thing. Got it? All right. <clears throat> so I'm particularly interested in this because this is where they would either take a break, so maybe sit under an apple tree or take a bath. Most often, though, they wouldn't do that. They would just switch. Incubation is when, after you've researched a problem, you take a step back from the problem. You work on something else. You relax. You allow all of that stuff that's in your, um, in your mind to sort of drift from your conscious to your subconscious. And truthfully, we don't know what happens then. There are four different theories of how incubation actually helps. Uh, the one that I like the best is what's called selective forgetting. So have you ever worked on a problem and you just keep coming up with the same wrong answer every time? Right? So that's selective forgetting basically says that your subconscious forgets those pathways that your mind wants to take all of the time and opens you up to new routes towards the solution, and so it might open that up. Other people say that it allows for combinations of ideas to happen. There's a bunch of different theories on what happens. But the idea is that in a period of incubation, we let the problem just sort of simmer. And then sometimes we have a house-like moment where we get that insight out of incubation. Other times we have to deliberately return to the problem. 
And the research supports that it doesn't matter which one you do, but if you have even as little as five minutes, if you have some time of incubation when you're working on a problem, you will have more ideas and you have better quality ideas when you return to that problem, just because of that incubation. Right? Now, when people are having that, that come out of that moment of incubation and get an answer, that, that feels like that shower moment. Right? But we still have evaluation and elaboration. Evaluation is when we decide whether or not that idea we had is any good. Right? We need to do that, remember, new and useful. And what I think is really interesting is everybody remembers when they got the good idea in the shower. Nobody tells stories about the bad idea in the shower. Right? But they exist, right? If Newton had gotten hit by an apple and worked on something of gravity that didn't work out, we'd not, we wouldn't be telling the story, right? Well, we, we shouldn't be telling it anyway because he didn't get hit. But you see my point, right? So there's this evaluation, deciding whether or not the idea is any good is still important. And then, and then uh, elaboration is sending it out into the world, right? And this is, this is actually where creativity involves risk, right? Because we're sending it out into the world and we're letting them decide. And as those of you that are going to be with me in the uh, breakout sessions, actually anybody in the breakout session, you're going to catch this. So I'll tell you now that sending it out into the world is really important because then the world will evaluate it and we'll learn things from that and we'll revise and we'll start back again at one. Right? And so it's an iterative process. Right? But a chief among, I think, those stages is recognizing what incubation means. Now, that said, not all of us could probably get away with taking a bath in the middle of the day. Right? Oh yeah, between my American history class and my uh, sociology class, I think I'll go back and I'll take a bath, and that way I'll do better. It's, I don't, that doesn't really work, right? We can't, maybe we can sit under an apple tree, but it might not help. So how do we, in trying to stay productive, actually incubate? Well, you have to ask yourself, what are the, the projects you're working on that don't require a high level of thought? And you have to sort of structure your day around them. So I'll tell you what I do is I use email. I get a lot of email, lots of people get a lot of email, so I'm not gonna complain about that because I probably don't get as many as, as other people, but most of those emails are really, really don't require high-level thinking, right? They, they're quick to respond to, yeah. Um, so most of those emails don't require high levels of, if only I had a brilliant insight when that happened, that would have been perfect. They don't require high levels of, of thinking. They're just like, yeah, 2.30 sounds great. Yes, I can be there. Hey, here's the attachment that you need, et cetera. And so I save all of those, and I, 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 call, I call it, I batch them. I've turned off push notifications on my phone. Right? I've turned off automatic email checking on my computer, and I only go to the well when I have time to incubate. So I'll, I'll start my morning, I'll be working on something, and when I feel like I'm burnt, when I feel like I've prepared thoroughly and I need time to incubate, then I'll go do that other stuff. Right? Now that's not to say email will work for you, but there is probably something in the work that you have to do that doesn't require high levels of thinking. Whatever that is, right, it can be easy to sort of save that to the end of the day and we'll knock it all out and then we'll go home, right, or do it first thing in the morning. My suggestion to you is to save it and use it when you need a period of incubation because that'll help you in those projects that actually require some level of creative or innovative thinking. Now that's the first of many stories. We're definitely not out of the woods yet. There's a lot of other myths that go on. And this one I think is really interesting, and I'll be honest, I've been worried about this one for a little while because speaking to educators and education groups about expertise as a myth is really kind of murky. So follow me here. We're going somewhere you're gonna like. Okay, so we think, right, we, we live in a society, and we think in a society that rewards expertise. The more education you have, the higher your salary. I'm not, I'm not arguing, right? Uh, I, I don't, well, I guess if I didn't have so much education, I'd be arguing, but I, I'm not arguing, right? We, when we have a really hard problem, who do we go to? The experts, people who have, who have been in that industry for more or longer, right? Who have been in that field, right? And that works great if somebody else has already solved the problem, right? Because essentially, what is a, a formal education? It's learning about problems other people have already solved. And when you, I think this is really interesting, when you study, those of you that have, have been in a, a doctoral program, like the first thing they did to me for a year is just beat it out of me that I knew anything, right? You're not allowed to say like, I think or I know. You're just, you're not, because you don't know anything, right? They, they drill that into you. All the PhDs in the room are laughing. Yeah, totally, right? Why? Because what a doctor is about is about finding new knowledge, right? And contributing to that body of knowledge. And to do that, you have to sort of take on beginner mindset again, right? Because what happens if you're only ever studying problems that other people have already solved is you're only gonna think of possible solutions that have already been thought of. And when you face a new problem, old solutions don't exactly help, do they? But yet we persist on. We think that as expertise goes up, creative output would go up, but it doesn't actually work that way. There have been several studies looking at everything from playwriting to physics, 
right? In fact, actually, there's a joke in, in physics that if you don't do Nobel Prize winning research by the time you're 30, you should just retire. It's kind of mean, right? Because 30 is, is not old by any stretch of the imagination, right? Nowadays, 30 is the new 12. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But it's actually based on research. If you look at the average age that a physicist was when they published the study that won them the Nobel Prize in physics, it actually is about 29, 31 years old, somewhere in that range, which is really interesting. And it begs the question, what's going on at 30 in that person's knowledge, right? So a 30-year-old that has going through education their entire life into physics has just gotten through, maybe they're in a postdoctoral fellowship, maybe they're still ABD, maybe they've just finished in their first couple years of um, doing research, so they're PhD and they're just doing research. They know enough to understand their problem, but they don't know enough to prejudge their solutions. So what happens with the people that have known, that know sort of more than this is they think of things, and those things sound crazy, and then they just push them away, right? Remember that last stage in the, in the five eggs, or excuse me, the second to last stage in the five eggs, evaluation, right? Eval how you evaluate an idea is really important. If you hear an idea that sounds like a problem that's already been solved and your mind goes right to that problem, you might end up evaluating that as useless. See, the thing about these 30-year-old physicists, right, besides the fact that they have the energy of 12-year-olds, right, the, the thing about these 30-year-old physicists is that when they, saw, when they come up with ideas, most of them, they might come up with 10 different ways to solve a problem. Most of them are crazy. 90% of the time when they go into evaluation, they're just going to find out, like the older, older guy or older girl told them, they're wrong. But every once in a while, they're not. And when you're not, we fly you to Scandinavia and we give you a really cool gold medal, right? And this happens in physics. It happens in medicine. It happens in, if you, if you actually correlate uh, playwrights and literature, there actually is an invert, a bell curve to the creative output, all because essentially there are two things involved when it comes to that insight stage and the evaluation stage. You have an ideation rate and an evaluation rate, the rate at which you're coming up with ideas and the rate at which you're moving forward with ones you've evaluated. Ideation rates actually stay consistent as, as expertise goes up, ideation rates go up. That's awesome. It's the evaluation rate that drops because as the ideas come up, you never bother to evaluate them because you just think in your head they'll never work. They sound too similar to an idea I've already heard about. So you never go after them. So this begs a really interesting question. How do you keep that mindset? <clears throat> we can't all be 30 forever, right? Some of us are like, man, so well, actually, this is really funny, I'm looking around at faces. Some of you can't even fathom when 30 is, <clears throat> and others of you can't remember when 30 was. <laughs> so this is really interesting. Um, so what do we do? And I think one of the best examples of how we, um, how we grow this sort of beginner mindset always, even when we gain expertise, is by following the model of a man named Paul Erdos. Where are my math nerds? Has anyone ever heard of Paul Erdos? <laughs> right, so I know where you are, but I actually can't see you because there's a light there, but awesome. Do, anybody know of Paul Erdos? Have you ever heard of him? I've just said his name like three times, so there should be more hands. But for those of you that didn't know him before today, Paul Erdos is famous for a couple different reasons. Paul, er, Paul Erdos has more peer-reviewed publications than anyone else ever. We actually don't know how many. We lost count around 1,500. 1,500. You can get tenure with like 12 good ones, right? 1,500, right? He's also famous because he's sort of the primary node in the mathematics network. There's this thing called the Erdos number. Those of you that know Erdos, does anybody have an Erdos number? Anybody know what theirs is? You sort of raise your hand. What's your Erdos number? You know what it is. Awesome. Well, that, if you know what it is, you're probably still like a seven. That's pretty good. What? You're gonna go with four. All right, so we'll go with four. And I'll explain what this all means, right? So the Erdos number is how close you are to having published with Paul Erdos. If you published with Paul, you're a one. If you publish with someone who published with Paul, you're a two. If you publish with someone who published with someone who published with Paul, you're a three, and so on and so on, right? It's sort of like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but for nerds. <laughs> Actually, that would imply that six degrees of Kevin Bacon is not for nerds, and that's not really true. Um, so, so why, why did, because he published so many papers and he collaborated with so many people, we have this Erdos number idea because Erdos was an intellectual and physical nomad. The title of his biography is My Brain is Open because this was the phrase that he would, he would show up at the office door or sometimes the house 
of people who wrote a paper that he thought was interesting. And he would say, my brain is open. And that was the sort of known code for, I want to collaborate with you. I want to learn from you. I'll teach you what I know. You teach me what you know. We'll publish some papers together. And then like Mary Poppins, I'll just, whew, I'm gone, right? And he did that so many times. And now I'm not advocating for the nomadic lifestyle, but I think there's something in that idea of always being willing to collaborate with multiple people and always being learned. If, if I may, Paul Erdos was T-shaped. So this is a really interesting term. It's actually started out as a, as a management consulting term, but it's a really popular term in the design thinking world. T-shaped means that you have an expertise in one sort of field. You have a deep level of knowledge. It's the vertical of the T. But you keep a working knowledge of all of these other different fields. So in Erdos's case, he had his subspecialty of mathematics that he would teach people, but he would collaborate with people all across the other subspecialties of, of mathematics. In the design thinking world, you might get somebody that, okay, you're an engineer, but you keep a, a, a knowledge of graphic design principles and sometimes even like ethnography or playwriting or all sorts of stuff across this horizontal. But unfortunately, a lot of the system that we live in is not really geared to make T-shaped people. It's geared to make I-shaped people. Because what do you do? You, you started with a broad education. You went to elementary school. Well, you went to kindergarten and learned like what a circle is, but then you went to elementary school and you began to learn a lot of different things. Middle school, high school, a lot of different things. You went to college, you began a lot of gen eds and you started to sort of specialize, right? If you went in and, and moved into a four year school, you specialize even more. You go into a master's program, you're specializing even more. And the people who have PhDs know an awful lot about very little, right? <clears throat> They're like lowercase i's because they have a deep knowledge about very little, right? And that's fine, and we need that to develop uh, lots of working in that field, but what I just told you earlier, the people that win Nobel Prizes are more T-shaped, right? The world will, will grow your vertical. If you have a passion and you follow along that, the world will grow your vertical. You have to take deliberate efforts to keep that horizontal going, right? So there's a couple different things I always recommend to people and do that, but I, one of the biggest is, and I'll tell you why in a second, is take a good look at the people you interact with most. If they all have the same major and are from the same area, you probably need not new friends, because you should keep those, they're probably nice people, I'm sure, <clears throat> but you need additional friends, right? Or one of my favorites is I tell people, go to a bookstore, if, if you can find one, go to a bookstore, and along the back wall or the side wall of every bookstore is what? A magazine rack. And we all have the section of the magazine rack that we like, right? There's sort of like the, the home and garden. I don't actually know what it's called because I don't like it, right? There's sort of the men's interests. So you got men's health and all sorts of like motorcycle magazines and stuff. Then there's like the business section, right? Then there's like the general news section. We all gravitate towards one. But we should probably all be reading something from all of them. So I'll tell people, skip your section. Buy magazines from all of those other sections. Just, you're not even looking for anything. Just buy them read them, and file that information away. Get comfortable with the discomfort of learning something new and look for that discomfort more and more and more and more. Right? Be T-shaped. Now, I said something about the five people you're interacting with, and I think this one is really important. There's, two, there's sort of two myths in here, in the, this lone creator idea. Because we so often tell stories of just the one person, right? Uh, I, I try and avoid saying this, but it's, it's a great example. I, I can never forget. We talk often about sort of Steve Jobs has his own mythology, right? Those of you, Steve Jobs founded what? Apple, Apple with Steve Wozniak. Oops, right? And then he was fired from Apple, and then he came back, and he transformed Apple, right? With Sir Johnny Ive. In fact, there's a lot of people that were responsible for the transformation app. We never do that, right? It's kind of weird. If as a team, and if as the leader of a team, you make a significant dent in the universe, the first thing we'll do is stop talking about all of the other people. It's kind of why we don't talk about Stuckley, right? And I think that's a tragedy, because what that does is it, it, tell, it sends this message that if you want to make a dent in the universe, if you want an outstanding creative idea, and you can't do it by yourself, you're not good enough. When in reality, all of those people had help. The only way you make a dent in the universe is with help. And if you look at every major person who made a huge dent in the universe, they had help. One of my favorite examples is a, an older version of the Steve Jobs, but an equal, if not more, level mythology, Thomas Edison. Right? Thomas Edison invented what? Light, oh shoot, I remember something about somebody else inventing that. <laughs> okay, 
All right, I'm hearing some right answers, which never happens. Um, so Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb. Thomas Edison was the 22nd or 23rd person to invent the light bulb, depending on how you count. Thomas Edison invented an economically sustainable light bulb, awesome. He also invented a system that you could plug that light bulb in that would give electricity to an entire city, which is probably more important, right? True story, his, his uh, first application for patent on the light bulb was rejected because it was too close to an already existing patent by a gentleman named John Starr. And John Starr is an interesting story because John Starr basically invented the light bulb that Edison ripped off. And when he sailed to Britain to get a patent in the UK, he got a patent in the UK, and on the, on the voyage back, his ship sank and he died. I know. I know I was, now I just bummed everybody out. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that knowledge, that knowledge was still there, and so Edison couldn't get a patent. He had to improve upon it. So Edison's light bulb patent is actually called improvement in electric lamps. So his patent was for improving John Starr's. And so at, the reason I tell you that story is that every time you see a light bulb, right, John Starr's legacy still lives on. Now you know that. It was not in vain, right? But truthfully, that wasn't his greatest invention. If you look at all of Edison's patents, there are usually other names on those patents. Because I believe that Edison's greatest invention was a facility called Menlo Park. Anybody here from New Jersey? New Jer awesome, awesome, cool. I was born outside of Philly, so I have like a... I actually understand what they mean when they say garden state. Those of you that have just looked across the Hudson River don't get it, but there is a garden there. Anyway, Edison's greatest invention was a facility called Menlo Park. See, shortly after he'd started his career, he made a little bit of money in telegraph patents, selling them to telegraph companies. He used that money to build a workshop in Menlo Park, New Jersey. The Menlo Park, California, by the way, is anybody from that area? Cool, Menlo Park, California is named after this facility in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And he invited all of his friends. And there, at any given time, there were between 10 and 15 people working on various different stuff. Sometimes Edison's projects, sometimes their own, sometimes just fun stuff. They were always sort of rotating around and collaborating with each other, which I think is really, really interesting because we always just talk about Edison. And we do that by design because pretty early in the history of, they called themselves the muckers, which it sounds like a dirty word, but it's not. Uh, because they were always mucking about in each other's business, right? That's why it's not. They figured out pretty early on that if they promoted and sold the idea that Thomas Edison would work on your project, they could get more money than if they promoted the idea that 15 people, Thomas Edison and his super friends, will work on your project. So Edison the myth was born because it made more money, which I think is really telling. There's something else that's really telling about Menlo Park, which is why that facility worked so well. The facility worked so well, to explain that, I actually have to explain to you how Broadway works. So the facility worked so well because of, I think, they didn't know this study, but because of some insights that come from a research study on Broadway. How many of you have ever been to a Broadway show? So <clears throat> to make a successful Broadway show, you need six people on, let's call it your senior leadership team. A composer, a librettist, a lyricist, choreographer, producer, director, you don't need to know what they all are. Uh, honestly, sometimes I forget. <clears throat> but you need to know that there are six of them, usually, give or take one. Uh, there are six of them. And so this brings up a really interesting question. What do we know about this team to make a great Broadway show? And so two gentlemen, Brian Uzi, Uzi literally like the gun, it's very unfortunate, and Jarrett Spiro did a research study looking at what is the right combination of old colleagues and new connections that we can get from these Broadway shows that will predict their success. So what they did was they, they literally built a database because IMDB wasn't around yet. They built a database of decades of these senior leadership teams and showed who was connected with who. Everybody from Cole Porter to Andrew Lloyd Webber is in this database. Who collaborated with who? Who worked on what teams with who? Who worked on what shows? Because a Broadway show, you'll meet together, you'll collaborate, you'll, you'll have opening night, eventually you'll end your run, and then you'll go find other work. So this is really interesting. Right? So what they essentially did is think about it this way. So think about you have, you have all of these brand new connections. Those will be the black nodes, right? If all these brand new connections, nobody's met anybody before, right? Or on the other side, you can have a team of people who have worked together, the entire team has worked together before. I like to call this Cats 2. I hope there never is a Cats 2, right? But think about like, oh, we've all worked together, so let's just do the sequel, right? And so Uzi and Spirit want to know what are the best, what are the best levels of uh, diversity of old and new connections? Right? Which ones predict success? And so what they did is they assigned every year for Broadway a score based on where these teams averaged out for the year, and then they correlated that to critical success and commercial success. Right? Now I'm curious, who do you want to vote for? Right? Do you think it's, they, they, gave it a, they gave it a number from one to five. The one would be all brand new connections. Anybody think one, 
Lots of brand new connections, fresh ideas. Of course not, it's Nerd Nation, you're too smart. Right, you know this, okay. Anybody wanna go for five? Over here, five. Lots of old colleagues, the tried and true, we've done the storming, norming, forming thing, and now we're, nobody? Okay, this is Nerd Nation, all right. <clears throat> Anybody wanna go for three? Three, you're all wrong. 2.6. Oh, I know, how do you have 0.6 of a person? I actually asked Brian Uzi that question, how do you have 0.6 of a person? And he said, you don't understand the study. And I said, that's, I am clear with that. I don't understand the study, I have 0.6 of a person. He said, we didn't study people or teams, we studied the network. The network was 2.6. By the way, cool insight on 2.6. It's just enough old colleagues to bring structure, but just enough new colleagues, right? If it were, if it were three, or if it were 2.5, it were a perfect balance, right? You wouldn't, you'd have to redo your structure. It's just enough old colleagues to bring structure, just enough new people to sort of question those structures and get new insights, which I think is interesting. But his biggest insight was it wasn't about the team, because if you have a 2.6 team, it won't stay a 2.6 team for long. The longer it works together, the more it becomes a five. Right, that's worked together before. So it was about the network and the quality of the network so that you could have 2.6 teams meet, form, collaborate, do the run, and disband. And that's what's going on in Edison's workshop. They're the muckers, right? They're working on some of Edison's projects, some of their own. They're actually stealing parts from each other. This is a really interesting story. When they, they moved Menlo Park to Dearborn, Michigan, Henry Ford bought it and wanted to set up a museum. And when they moved it, there were pieces missing from the different inventions. And the curators freaked out until a historian said, no, 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 that's all perfectly normal. Because there was, a, there was a sort of an unstated code that if you were working on a project that needed a part that somebody else's project had, you would just take it. Kind of, now you know why they're called the muckers. And maybe they wanted to use some other word. Um, <clears throat> but so they would just take it. And they were, so they were always rotating around. And that I think is really interesting because so much of this, these ideas around creativity are about how do you build a culture, how do you build a team that works, and it's quite interesting to me because it's actually not about the team, it's, it's about the network, right? Your five friends that we talked about earlier, they're lovely people, but that's not enough. What you need is to be plugged into a network, a network that allows you to have 2.6 teams around your problem. See, I teach uh, undergraduate and graduate students, and it's, I think this is really funny, I always randomize teams, and they always complain until we have a heart-to-heart -heart about this study, and then they always get it, right? They always sort of get that you need to be a broader network. I want the class to be an entire network. I don't care that you have five friends that you've worked together with well before. That's irrelevant. I want, the, I want you to see the class as a network. But of course, what are they complaining about? When they complain that they want to be on their team, what are they complaining about? They don't know anybody, and so they won't get along, right? There'll be conflict, et cetera, right? And this, I think, is really interesting because this is another myth. We have this feeling about creativity that it should be fun and playful and exciting, and if there's friction and frustration, you're doing it wrong, right? We look at these companies, especially tech companies, et cetera, and companies in California, I mean, California in general just gets this laid back reputation, but we look at them like there are, there's free food all of the time, there's bring your animal to work day. I can't even say dog anymore, because it's just whatever, right? You got an iguana? Awesome, bring it, right? It's not casual Friday, it's casual every day, right? One of my favorite examples is the company Pixar. Pixar has life-size, well, I guess not life-size, because sometimes they're larger than life, character statues sprinkled about their campus. There's a 20-foot tall Luxo Junior lamp at the entrance. You're nodding your head like, I've seen it. I've been there. It's cool, isn't it? It's awesome. Makes you think like, man, this must be a great place to work. There's this, in the main atrium, there's a cereal bar with like 30 different cereals anytime you want. Just get Fruit Loops. You want, you want Fruit Loop cornflakes? Got it, awesome, right? Seems like it'd be so much fun, but in reality, it can be incredibly frustrating to work at Pixar because of what they call their dailies or their shredding sessions. See, Pixar animators and directors get together on a regular basis, sometimes daily when it's crunch time, and they examine the work that they've been doing, and Pixar animates at 26 frames by second, and they go frame by frame through a film. Think about how long that would take. Right? In fact, if you're animating 26 films a second, that means your entire day, you might have done like mm, half a second worth of work. And then the next day, you're gonna meet in the morning with your Fruit Loop cornflakes, and somebody else is gonna tell you what you did wrong. 
and they're gonna, there's friction there. They're gonna say, I don't like Woody's eyes. He looks really inauthentic and devious. Which is awful, right? No amount of Fruit Loop cornflakes is gonna solve that, right? It can be <coughs> really depressing, right? So what Pixar has done, Pixar has invented a system that can, can provide this friction because we need it, right? It makes the film better. We changed Woody's eyes, right? But we also don't want people to be suicidal, right? So what they do, they stole it actually from the world of improv. Has anybody ever taken an improv, improvisational comedy class? Okay, the first rule of improv is what? Yes, and. Some, peop some people say always accept an offer, right? Yes, and. The idea is to always be building. So in improv, if you come on stage and I say, officer, I'm so glad you're here, you are now a police officer. You don't get to say, no, 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 I'm just a bystander. How can I help? Right? You don't get to say that because you're disrupting the flow. You're not building. So what Pixar does is they want even their constructive criticism to be building. So they, they coined a term, they call it plussing, which means even when you provide negative feedback, even when you say Woody's eyes make him look devious here, it's awful, you have to add a plus. You have to extend an offer. You have to give something that they can build on. So you have to say, Woody's eyes look really, really inauthentic. What if we narrowed them at the corners so he looked a little bit more like it was an authentic smile? Right? There's a sociologist in the room, it's a Duchesne smile, right? It's the, uh, you, if you want to fake a smile, by the way, you need to, you, your eyes. If not, we'll know. All right, so <clears throat> they'll actually give a suggestion. And so what you get is not only is your, your, your half a second of film shredded, but you're given suggestions for how to put it back together. And then this is, this is also really important. When you leave the room, you alone or the director have the right to accept or reject that feedback. But the idea is that it's not enough to just say, this sucks. You have to say, this sucks, and I care enough about the project to offer you a way to solve it. And by plussing, you're actually saying, I care. When most people give criticism, they don't do this, right? They just tell you what's awful about it. Most people don't give you that plus. But at Pixar, if you do that, they'll look at you and they say, you owe me a plus. Right? Because you owe me a suggestion. If you're going to criticize, you owe me a way to make it better. And that way, I'm leaving with a quiver full of ideas to go back to the drawing board with. Right? I'm, I'm, that's like a total mixed metaphor there. I apologize. I don't know why you would need arrows to go back to the drawing board. But you get the idea. <laughs> so you're, you're leaving with a, whole, a grab bag full of stuff that you can use. Right? And I think that's amazing. And I think that's what... It's not the Fruit Loop cornflakes. That's what keeps people coming back and so happy and animated. Is that when you plus... You tell people, I value criticism, I know that friction makes the project better, and I care enough about you and this project to do both. Now, a, a word, actually, here. Um, so I wrote this book, and I talked about plussing and all that sort of stuff, and my wife read it, and she read about plussing. <laughs> so if you get the chance, don't tell your spouse about plussing. Because then you're never allowed to complain anymore. You have to offer constructive criticism. All right. So, but in every no, I'm kidding. Actually, it would make even that better, and it has made it better. So, because plussing is an offer, it's an extension that I care enough about you and the project. So, plussing is what keeps that cohesion productive. Keeps it. The technical terms would be keeps it task focused instead of person focused on the criticism. Right. But even when we do that, let's say we do all of that. There are ten myths in the book. We've talked about several. We're still not out of the woods yet. We have to talk about my, I'm not going to say my favorite because it's awful, right? But we have to talk about this one because it's, I think it's the most important. This one affects that blue field, the social environment, so much. And it's this misconception about creativity. We think that if you build a better mousetrap, what? The world will beat a path to your door, right? We've all heard this saying before. Some people actually always say you'll catch a better mouse, and I've never, I've never understood that saying. Um, <clears throat> but if you, we've heard this saying, if you build a better mouse. Interesting point of fact on this saying, I cannot find the original author. I can find who people attribute it to, and then when you go through their writing, you can never find it. And I think there's a good reason for that. I think the original author, whoever it was, probably knew that this was a terrible phrase, <clears throat> right? Take the actual mousetrap, right? I'm saying this word mousetrap several times, and what are you all envisioning? Wooden board, right? I like that. That's cool. A spring, some cheese, because there's always free cheese in a mousetrap, right? All of these sort of things, right? That mousetrap was invented in 1899. 1899. 
which interestingly enough, this is totally coincidental, was the same year that Charles Duell, who was the head of the US Patent Office, testified before Congress and said, I recommend that we close the Patent and Trademark Office. Nothing new is going to be invented. <laughs> and I mean, he was right about the mousetrap, right? But he was wrong about a lot of stuff. Actually, he was wrong about the mousetrap. Every year, there are 400 patent applications for presumably better mousetraps. 20 of them have turned into commercially viable products. I once actually spoke to a group called the Pest Control Technology Summit. And they told me when to use the different mousetraps, right? And for example, they told me, and this, you file this away, this will be infinitely useful to you in your life. They told me that peanut butter works better than cheese. So if you remember nothing else from this morning, I guess remember that. Um, <clears throat> peanut butter. All right. So every year, so there are all of these better mousetraps, but you envision that one, right? Which is really interesting. Really interesting. And says something about this idea that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. And it isn't just mousetraps that this applies to. Right? Igor Stravinsky. Has anyone ever heard of Igor Stravinsky? Igor Stravinsky wrote what? The Rite of Spring. You all sort of knew that. Has anybody ever heard of the Rite of Spring? Come on. Has anybody ever watched Fantasia? Yeah. There's always more hands for Fantasia. You have heard the Rite of Spring, right? It's in there, right? The Rite of Spring is famous not only because it was a pivot point in the history of ballet and musical composition, but also because on its opening night in Paris, it caused not one, but two riots. So it, it departed from where ballet was going. It was full of cacoph cacophonous tones. It was a very sort of naturalistic, humanistic um, ballet choreography. And there were people that really didn't like it because it was so different. And there were, all, there were some people in the audience that did like it, but there were a lot of people who didn't like it. And those two camps began to argue. And argues turned into shouts. Shouts turned into shoves. Shove turns into fists. Fist turns into a riot. Parisian police actually stormed into the theater to quell the riot. And then for some really stupid reason said, on with the show. Um, <laughs> and the same thing happens. Stravinsky himself had to flee the theater, never got to see the curtain close on his opening night. And now it's in Fantasia. And we show it to five-year-olds. And they don't hit anybody. Well. <laughs> They don't hit anybody because of the Rite of Spring. So what's going on here? See, remember the words I said earlier, a creative idea by definition has to be what? New and useful. And we found out through research that we as humans are terrible at combining these two different concepts in our head. See, when an idea is new, by definition, it departs from the status quo. It is not what you have seen before. It is something different. It is something new. But how do we judge whether or not something is useful? What do we have to go on? Our past experiences, the status quo we just diverted from, all of that, right? And the research supports that we're awful at reconciling these two things, especially in times of uncertainty. People will say that they want new ideas, new solutions. They want to think outside the box. And then when we're presented those exact same things, they reject them, right? Consciously, we say we want creativity. Unconsciously, we reject it at every chance we get. And this, I think, is the biggest lesson for that social environment we talked about earlier. Right? There, was a, there was an education researcher, Paul Torrance, one of the most famous researchers on creativity. And Paul Torrance said that somewhere between third and fourth grade, people start to fall out of practice for creativity. And those of you that are thinking about uh, the education system, what happens around fourth grade? Fourth grade is kind of the tipping point between fun and recess and sit down, you've got to learn. Fourth grade is when we figure out that there are right answers and we don't appreciate your different answers. And that's not to, to diss the system, because there's something to be said for acquiring all of that knowledge. But the problem is we, we subtly change the social environment when we do that. Because what we teach people is that if you want a good grade, sit down, regurgitate the information to me, and you'll be fine. And we need that for a time, but what is the lesson of the expert myth? We also need people who are willing to be T-shaped, and willing to question, willing to come up with new ideas. And especially if your position of leadership, this is really convicting for, for me as a professor, right? Because I'm constantly given these new ideas. People are trying to learn the material that I'm teaching and they're coming up with new ideas. How do I steer them in a way that points them to the answer that I want them to learn, right? Because I'm, fundamentally, I'm teaching them a lot of old knowledge, old solutions to other problems that they need to know in order to come up with new solutions. But how do I do that in a way that delays the judgment on their other idea? Right? that doesn't send that message, that sit down, regurgitate the answer. Right? In organizations, the same thing happens. One of my friends, Dave Owens, calls this a hierarchy of no, because in an organization, and those of you that ever tried to get anything done in an organization, uh, 
know that you have a great idea and maybe your community will like it, your manager, your dean, what have you will like it, and then it goes up and up the system and everybody at every level has to like it, has to say yes. But if you get just one no, the whole thing falls apart. It's a hierarchy of no. And some of the most innovative companies, some of the most innovative organizations have found ways to delay judgment. But to be honest with you, this is an area where we're really not winning the fight. This is an area we haven't really figured out. I have, I have two sons. Uh, they're three years old and one year old. And I'm paranoid of this because fourth grade is coming, right? The world is coming, and it's going to teach them that there are right answers. And how do I build a social environment that says, yes, we learn, but we also explore? Right? How do I build that? I don't know. And the, the, the ironic thing about this is that most of the time, this message, it, it starts with this message. The first solution, by the way, is to realize th exactly what I'm telling you. We need like a creatives anonymous, right? Hi, I'm Dave, and I have a bias against really good ideas. <laughs> uh, because just becoming aware of it, when you hear something that makes you uncomfortable, will give you just enough time to pause and go, wait a minute. Do I shoot this idea down right away? Do I delay judgment? Do I allow them to sort of take a step in the water and test something, right? Some of the most innovative companies have designed systems that'll say, hey, anything under $1,000, just test. Here, here's a Visa gift card, go, right? Present your results, and, but there's no harm for failing, right? That's a good step, right? But I think it starts with just every individual recognizing, I'm Dave and I have a bias against creative ideas, right? And now I'm gonna do something about that, right? Awareness is that sort of first step. Because when I come, most of the time, I, most of the speaking that I do, most of the consulting that I do, and most of the teaching that I do is into the business realm, right? I teach students who are gonna go off into business. I speak a lot of businesses, and, but in any organization this is true, they bring me in because they say, we wanna be more creative. We want our people to have more creative ideas. But I know the, the three circles in the blue field. I know the mousetrap myth. I know that creativity, innovation, fundamentally in organizations is not an idea generation problem. We don't need our people to have more great ideas. It's an idea recognition problem. We need to get better at seeing the ideas they already have. And so this is my challenge to you, in addition to help rewriting all of these different myths, right? There's a lot of stories that we tell ourselves, and they become true even if they're not true, and this one is the most damaging. There are 10 in the book. You heard five today. The other four, if we solve those, that would be amazing, but all it'll do is create a bottleneck until we solve this one. So let's start here, if you're with me, let's start here. Let's start with this realization that it's not an idea generation problem, it's an idea recognition problem. Let's start with the social environment and let's start asking ourselves, what if the key to being more creative isn't how do we come up with more ideas? What if the key, and this is really awesome for what your next session is, what if the key is how do we listen better to the ideas that we already have? Fundamentally, the most important thing I can tell you about all of these different myths is that we don't need more ideas. We have all of the creative capacity we need to solve even the toughest problems in the world. We need to get better at seeing the ideas, evaluating the ideas, recognizing the ideas, and applying the ideas. That's when creativity becomes innovation. That's when our problems are solved. We don't just need more ideas. We need to get better at applying the ideas that we already have.